All right, so we have Matt Galligan from Circa coming on board. And he's got, I'm just, every single time I see your facial hair, I'm just jealous. It's just so, what? so good. Your facial hair, it's just always so good. It, it doesn't take much, Ryan. It well, take, just I, time. I can't. I just, I need to just work on it. Just give it time. Yeah, just time. Is that everything? Hi, everyone. That's what we're going to talk about today. Facial hair. Facial hair. Yeah, you probably didn't expect that. I'm, I'm actually launching facial hair hunt today. Whoa, so okay. You'll be able to vote up beards. I like that. There's, there's, a, there's a big beard, beard community out there. There's an opportunity for that. Uh, so first off, Circa, you had a big launch last week. Yes, Do you we want did. to talk about what you launched and also what Circa is? Yeah, so uh, first off, Circa is a mobile news company. So we produce news with the intent of it being read in a mobile environment. So you know, all the articles and things like that that are out there, we tried something a bit different where we boil it down into just the facts. Think Cliff's Notes for News, the bullet point news, whatever that is. But the key twist is that for any story that you actually care about, you can follow it. And as the story progresses, you get all of the updates around that story and can stay very intimately in touch with that individual story. In the beginning, uh, we launched only on mobile. So we had an iPhone only experience. Uh, a year later, we launched an Android version. And now, two and a half years into it, we launched our website, <laughs> which is uh, kind of a little bit different than the traditional path. But we, we did it because we recognize the value that uh, the web provided us, meaning that there is a uh, excellent discovery experience that could be had. Uh, the serendipity of that is a big deal. Being able to bring someone in from a source like Reddit and then show them, hey, you know, here's this story that you read. It was very quick. It was very easy. But here's all the rest of this stuff that we have. It was, uh, it was a no-brainer. It just took us a bit of time. Yeah, and, and focus is, is an important thing. We have a mobile app. However, we're actually unlike very many other companies right now, not focused on mobile so much. We're really focused on the web. So I'm going to ask the first question, but if you have any questions, at Reply Me, RR Hoover on Twitter, and I'll bring them up. But the first question I actually have is related to marketing and acquisition. So now that you have the web property, you have a whole new channel for acquisition. But on the mobile space, it's really hard to stand out. There's so many apps out there. What have you done to grow your user base and get users? Well, for the most part, everything for us so far has been purely word of mouth. And we've done well with that. Uh, but word of mouth is only going to get you so far. So for us, is sort of this next phase where we really have something new that we've got to try. I've got a question for the people in the audience, and this is actually a pretty simple one. How many people read some sort of link of some sort of news uh, something today? Just show of hands. OK. How many of you were compelled to download the corresponding app? That's pretty easy. So the whole reality is that we are bombarded with links and news and all this stuff all day long. And any link is just the same as any other link for most people. So the challenge for a news company, especially one that is app focused, is getting people to actually make that install happen. So a lot of people talk about conversion as being like the number one thing that you're trying to get to. In the app world for news, it's really, really, really tough to get that conversion. So. For now, and the other part I'll add is it's hard to adapt uh, in a native experience compared to the web. That's one benefit we have on the web is we can change it so frequently. No and so question. Fast. There's, I, I recall you definitely talking about that, being able to kind of on the fly change some things. And we'll now use our web uh, presence as a way to understand what changes we might need to make. But from the app perspective, we, we want to change where the conversion happens. We want to send that a little bit down the way so that we're not so reliant on somebody coming into a link and immediately saying, download this app. So for us, it's not yet out there, but we'll tie it back to our follow feature. Because it's so unique, because nobody else has this feature, we have an opportunity to get in there and say, hey, you know, you're reading this. You like this. Do you want to stay in touch with this story? Getting them to either give us an email or an SMS and not sending them anything else other than updates to that story. But when you receive that update, that's when the click happens and you understand the value of this. That's when you ask. So for us, it's a matter of, for us and anybody else out there doing anything like this, it's a matter of, OK, try to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and realize that when you land on that page, that your first inclination is not to install that app. How do you get to help them understand the aha moment, that value, and then get them to install? Yeah. So Jeff Morse Jr., huge Product Hunt fan. I'm, I'm a fan of his, has a question. Do you think newspapers will exist in 20 years? Uh, yes, but I think that they will be premium products on really, really nice paper and probably hand delivered to you by some courier, and they'll probably charge you $2,000 a year for it. 
I think that the I think the news business will continue to exist, and I think people still want that paper product, but it won't be anywhere near the mass product that it is today. Yeah. Uh, Kelly has a question here. What's something amazing one of the users, one of your users of Circa, has said that's impacted the product? So you get a lot of feedback. Um, and another kind of tangent or follow on to that is how do you know what to listen to when people are giving you so many different ideas? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, we, we get so much feedback all the time. And I'll, I'll kind of go two different directions from this. Um, one a moment of impact would be there was a news story that came out about the uh, there was a this thing called the norovirus in in Colorado that was going on uh, it was a, 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 a unfortunately a deadly disease that was uh, uh, infecting small children in Colorado and a handful of other areas and fairly little known media wasn't doing a whole lot to talk about it but we had something out there and uh, unbeknownst to us we had someone that was a avid circa reader that read that story recognized the symptoms in their child from that story, took them to the doctor, and was successfully diagnosed with norovirus and was OK. And it was just this realization that, uh, well, hey, we have this inc incredible, impactful opportunity with the people that read us. They trust us. They believe this stuff. Like, and so for us, it was more of a, of a pivotal moment of an understanding of just how much people relied on our service that that was a catalyst for not only our product people, but our the people that actually write the news. So it was a major, major event for us. As far as the advice thing, like, or just ideas that people have and listening to it, it can be really hard. And sometimes you have to get to the crux of what it is they're actually wanting. So right now, we're not super pleased with the, the current design in the app. Like we, we, we kind of got in a bind and we had to ship something. And we know we want to change that. And people tell us you know, that it's hard to read. Well. Yes, you know, in some way I could read through that. And some people say that it's distracting. And some people, plenty of people will give us their ideas of what it is. But only until you ask the real question, which is, do you think that, you know, X is hard to do because of Y, do you really understand? So really it's, you, you get through that by trying to just whittle away, peel back that onion and get to the crux of what the actual problem is before you can try and come up with an answer. It's a really convoluted answer, sorry. No, it's, it's, I asked you two questions in one, so great answer. So uh, Thomas, earlier in this Twitter, Twitter stream, mentioned uh, this kind of recurring theme that's been coming up today is culture and, and how you build team. And, and you have how many people on your team now? 22. 22. Substantial size. Now, how, do you, how do you manage a team, and how do you build a culture, and how do you make sure you bring on the right people? That's a really good, uh, very important, and very difficult question to answer. Uh, so, you know, I will say that the current team that we have in place in Circa, uh, save for a couple of people, uh, is not the same team that we started out with. And there was a, there was a difficult moment uh, a little while ago where we realized that everybody around the table had so much merit and, and so much uh, talent, but the fit wasn't just quite right. And so we, we had a hard moment of real, uh, deciding, well, hey, do we try to fix this? Do we try to address this? Do we try to find uh, a better fit? And we did. And so the learning from that was simply, hey, culture is incredibly important. And culture means so many different things. It can mean that you're cool to hang out with after, the, you know, after office hours are done. It can mean that when you're uh, going about your work throughout the day, that there's, I don't know, a joke that hits the Slack channel and people all kind of join in. Culture is very important, and now we're in this, this moment where we want to start bringing on remote employees because I'm pretty sure that San Francisco is totally untenable for most startups at this point as far as cost is concerned. So we're about to bring on our first remote engineer from, uh, from Austin, and so as to make sure that they were not feeling left out of this whole like team, uh, we've started to institute mandatory remote work Fridays. So our team now works remotely entirely uh, every Friday. And we sort of have our end of the week wrap up on a Thursday. And then everybody works from wherever they want on that Friday. But it helps sort of catalyze what it means to be a remote worker, helps internalize that, and then helps make sure that whoever is remote feels included. Uh, so really, it's about making sure that everybody is happy, moving forward, able to get things done. So I want to actually ask a question that I'm really interested in is the media and news space in general. In your mind, and I'm going to keep this kind of general so that you can answer it in any way you want, but in, in which ways do you see it changing over the next few years? We have different platforms emerging. Mobile is clearly uh, 
it's what we use every day, multiple times. I think people check their phone a gazillion times a day on average. That's science. That's fact. Um, there's Apple Watch coming out. There's even like VR and other things that are emerging. What do you see in the future of, of media and news, and, and how do you play a role in that, do you think? Media is was a new thing to me, a brand new thing to me. So I got started in this space a little over three years ago. It was something I've never experienced before. Really, I just like solving problems, and I saw some problems in news, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go try to do this. There was something very simple that I discovered as I got into media, which was that there was such a dramatic lack of product thinking that existed in the media world. And it didn't take me too long to realize why. And here you have an industry that largely was not disrupted for a hundred years, right? How many, how many industries can you look to that largely had an unchanged product and unchanged business model and all these things for a hundred years? And I sort of liken it to the music industry, whereas in the music industry, there is a dramatic shift that comes probably every 15 years, every 10 to 15 years, and they scream that the sky is falling and everything is falling apart and everything is awful, but you know what? They've persevered every time. In the news world, they've gone unchanged for 100 years. So now we're at this moment where a lot of the media world would be really happy if the internet just didn't exist. They, they're like, man, we'd still have our businesses if that pesky internet just wasn't there anymore. And so you have a, a world that's going to have to change so dramatically so quickly, but product is the piece that is at the center of all of it because to them, the content has always been the product. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the delivery mechanism was simply the paper that you received. And so that was the product in total, meaning that it was the words on the page that were the product. Now the words are, you know, not secondary, but certainly you know, right up there with product and how it's delivered and how it's experienced and all those things. The greatest shift that will happen in media will be because of the amount of product thinking going into these things and alternative ways of consuming news. But it'll also be the greatest challenge that most of the incumbents will experience. So Kelly has an, uh, Kelly's asking good questions. I think Kelly's asking the best questions today. So Circa, for those that don't know, you have humans behind the scenes curating and writing some of this content. Her question is, what advantage do human editors have over machine learning or AI? And for those that don't know, there's also a lot of algorithm and machine-based writing, essentially, writing articles for right now. And uh, why have you gone with that approach? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. One, when we got this thing off the ground, you know, we, we had to ask ourselves a, a couple of questions. A, is the thing that we want to get done even possible with computers? And the, the answer was no, flat out no because we do this atomized approach, meaning that every fact is in and of itself its own little atom and its own thing, and we wanted to be able to deliver updates over time, there wasn't enough really good stuff out there that would allow computers to parse apart all of the individual facts within multiple stories across news articles, things like that, to really come up with any salient article. Didn't exist, so that was part one. Part two is it's actually possible to deliver really high quality, very compelling and convincing work when you're dealing with statistically driven information. So sports stories and financial stories are, are perfect for that kind of world. Because there are only so many ways that you can say that you know, so-and-so hit a grand slam into right field. There are literally only so many ways. So a computer can very convincingly produce a piece like that. But for what we want to do, when you're dealing with stories like deaths at the hand of ISIS, like the Boston Marathon bombing, there was one thing that a computer doesn't have that a human has, and that's a heart. Like, it's an ability to understand and empathize with the audience and know why you might focus on this one bit of information that might be the human element that maybe a computer wouldn't know. Great. So before we move on, other than the web, which you just launched, what else do you have going at Circa? Uh, a lot of what we're doing is um, actually internally focused right now. So I'm, I'm very excited about the Apple Watch. I'm very excited about wearables in general. And I think we have a really amazing opportunity to, uh, uh, to sort of come out with something very compelling. But internally, you know, our own tools matter a lot. We built our own custom CMS to be able to deliver news in the way that we do. And, and we've been working off of our existing platform for two and a half years. It's time for a change. It's time to improve that. And that's what we've been working on for some time. And the second side of that is as many product management tools that exist out there for software development, there isn't one for news. 
there isn't some sort of workflow software that makes the news production process at all make sense. And so that's the other thing that we're working on for ourselves as well as to bring other newsrooms into this fold and hopefully make news in other places more efficient as well. The news production process, I should say. Interesting. So you'll start providing tools for third parties, potentially news outlets themselves, that can leverage your platform, I'm assuming, and also their own internal processes? A absolutely. We, we've sort of built superpowers into our own process. I mean, I have a team of 10 journalists, or, or, or the, the team that we have at Circa is, is 10 folks, and we're able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with newsrooms of four times our size, covering just as much because of all of the unique things that we built into our process and our tools. We want to give those same capabilities to whoever else is out there. Costs are being cut left and right. There's newsrooms that are being shrunk everywhere. So how can we help them make a more efficient product in general? That's very cool. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks, dude.